Uh, and uh, now I have the pleasure to ask our friend Brian Islin to take the floor. Brian, we're looking forward to listening to your always interesting intervention. You have the floor. Thanks very much, Michelle, for the kind invitation to be here again, talking demand. Uh, I will try and live up to your expectations of uh, being entertaining. So ever, ever since I was a counter narcotics agent more than 20 years ago, I've been applying the lessons learned from tackling illicit drugs to other crime types. And it's on that basis since 2004, 17 years, I've been advocating for demand side approaches to modern slavery. Although I have to admit that back then we weren't even using this umbrella term modern slavery. That's a much more recent phenomenon. Anyway, in demand side advocacy, law and policy plays an important potential role. And both in a civil and a criminal context, you'll probably be surprised by me saying civil, but I'll address that a little bit later and you'll understand what I'm talking about. To be clear, I'm not talking about demand side interventions on trafficking for sexual exploitation. It's clear after decades of experimentation that demand side measures are the only thing that work in that sector. Tonight, I'm talking about the area of modern slavery and supply chains, so uh, including trafficking, uh, servitude, forced and child labor. So let's be in no doubt what the principle of criminal liability actually says about modern slavery in supply chains, because whenever I talk to businesses, they principally just duck and weave. Now, a company either doesn't know if there is modern slavery in their chain, in which case they're potentially criminally negligent, or they do know and they're just plain criminal. It is a dichotomy. It is binary. And this very obvious dichotomy is completely lost on most people, especially companies. And it gives companies the benefit of the doubt in a way that no other criminal would ever get. What is not happening is any kind of enforcement of this criminal liability. And, and I mean, this is part, there are a lot of reasons for this. It's partly because laws don't exist to apply criminal liability to companies extraterritorially for modern slavery in their supply chains. It's partly because no enforcement resources are allocated to enforce this liability from state agencies. There has not been a single successful criminal case anywhere in the world brought against the company for modern slavery in their supply chain. And partly also because there's actually no political appetite to take on businesses, especially big businesses. There's no political appetite to make this a matter for criminal enforcement. What has been applied, but in a rather, let's say, ad hoc manner, is actually trade sanctions. Witness the US customs blocking the import of surgical gloves from the Malaysian company Top Glove. You've probably all heard about this case because of allegations of forced labor in their business. The same too with recent trade sanctions in the US and Europe against companies that use cotton picked under forced labor conditions in, in the Xinjiang province of China. It's not, clear, it's not clear that any of these sanctions have actually changed business behavior though. We'll only be able to really tell that in the long run. On balance, what we might expect though from this, from this is actually more obfuscation in supply chains simply to avoid liability. So the companies that have a supply chain that goes back to Xinjiang, they'll add layers. They'll add layers in the middle that become, a, uh, become their excuse for not doing anything. But in any case, whether hugely effective or only a little bit, trade sanctions are one way of disincentivizing using business, using behavioral economics, uh, disincentivizing business complicity in human rights abuses in their business and supply chains. But sanctions are not criminal law. The criminal law is not being used or uh, applied to police modern slavery and supply chains. So that simple fact brings me on to the next thing I want to talk about here. What legal responses could be adopted by the state to bring about more focus on modern slavery and supply chains? I want to talk firstly about public procurement as a demand side mechanism. One of the greatest demand side levers that we can pull on modern slavery and supply chains is public procurement. And why? There's one very simple reason. Public spending in the OECD alone is worth 9 trillion euros a year. If even a minuscule percentage of that could become ethical purchasing, we have an enormous force for good by states to incentivize businesses to do better. Now, I won't talk too much about this because I know Mark wants to, to talk about it from a legal standpoint, but I want to just share an idea about it briefly from a corporate standpoint. Now, in, with one of my other hats and, and for my sins, I've worked a long time on public procurement 
tenders, that is bidding for contracts from government and, and super state organizations. And I can tell you one thing with absolute certainty. When a new evaluation grid, this is the grid how bids are scored, comes out with new conditions, every company bidding for those tenders gears up to be able to eke every single last point out of that scoring. If gender is added, they treat gender. If climate action gets more points, more effort is spent on climate actions. If modern slavery or human rights were to be added, companies will absolutely start doing what it takes to squeeze every last point out of it. Public tendering, let's be clear, it's a cutthroat, hugely competitive business. Contract award decisions often come down to one point. I've won and lost tenders by one point. And we all know there's no price for second best. And when losing, the bid manager just downs a whiskey and starts all over again, making sure that next time they get every point they can. So if they lost because they didn't do enough on human rights, because human rights is now part of the grid, next time they'll fix it and they'll win a higher percentage of tenders as a result. So they actually have a very personal vested interest in making sure their company can comply because their job is on the line. If they're not winning those tenders, their job is finished. An example of a fairly simple application of this approach is the inclusion of a reasonable number of points for human rights due diligence in the evaluation grids. And I say reasonably high because it doesn't have to actually be very high at all. Even a few points, like I say, with one point difference, you can lose a tender. Every few points will trigger improved compliance. From my bidding experience, points, anywhere points between five and 10 for anything makes it a top priority. Five to 10 points in the evaluation grid from public procurement agencies has the potential to be an absolute game changer in, as a demand side intervention against modern slavery. Evaluation grids, interestingly, almost never require a legislative change. Often, they normally just demand a policy tweak. So in the UK recently, for example, the cabinet, I think three months ago, the cabinet office simply took a decision to order that 10% of the evaluation for all public procurement in the, US, in the UK is now to address social sustainability. I don't know whether you're familiar with the ESG framework, but social sustainability is a great example of a fairly awful, indirect, euphemistic phraseology that basically means human rights. So now a further point to consider is that a company that is modern slavery diligent and can prove it, losing a tender to a company that is not potentially gives that losing company a civil cause of action against either the agency or the winning bidder. And I'll talk a little more about civil action a little later. But in any event, adding a simple five to 10 points for human rights due diligence to public procurement evaluation grids is potentially one of the easiest and most powerful hip pocket nerve ways of changing the way businesses do business, driving them to address human rights in their business and incentivizing them to address the elephant in the boardroom which is their criminal liability for modern slavery in their business. I wanted to mention something that is almost never discussed, civil litigation. Now, I raise civil actions because they are not happening, but in fact, they can and they should. Civil lawsuits are potentially a very effective demand side measure. Now, to explain what, a civil, what civil litigation is for those who are not so familiar with it and how it differs from criminal cases, civil and criminal cases have something in common, which is the burden of proof. The burden of proof in both civil and criminal cases of producing the evidence required to prove the case falls to the one making the claim. And then, the, so the burden of proof lies with the party asserting an allegation of fact, and that's a principle of most legal systems. But the viability of civil actions comes about in, in talking about demand side uh, measures for human trafficking, because of, not because of the burden of proof, but because of the standard of proof. In criminal cases, the standard of proof, as we all know, is beyond a reasonable doubt. You've all heard the phrase. It's a very high standard coming from a police background. I can tell you it's super high. But in civil suits, the legal standard of proof is lower. It's on the balance of probabilities. Now, what that means is if the person bringing the lawsuit satisfies the balance of probabilities for all of the facts that need to be proven to make out the cause of action, they will probably win the case. And the even better news is that it perhaps only takes even just one case of modern slavery in a supply chain to form the basis for a civil action against the apex company, the company that ends up 
with buying that product through the supply chain. So the Nikes and Amazons and so on. So this case essentially hinges on the basis of the claimant proving that the case of mod the one case of modern slavery is probably true. If we could start to see civil suits of this sort against companies for modern slavery in their supply chains, suddenly the risk to companies may takes a step up. And you heard uh, Claire talk in the beginning about risk of detection and cost of detection. And these are really two important characteristics. The cost of detection is something we can always increase. The risk of detection is something we generally can't afford to increase because it means more police, it means more this, more that. So civil suits against companies increases the risk to companies and increases, in particular, it increases the cost to companies. And so that manifests in a company in a number of ways. And these ways really focus the minds of senior people in companies. The first thing is company directors suddenly need to be insured against liability for that civil action. Shareholders start demanding a higher standard to reduce their human rights risk. Investors start demanding the same for the risk reduction reasons. Lawyers need to be retained by companies at potentially enormous cost to fend off growing civil actions because once one becomes successful, everybody will jump on. And considerable senior staff time at these big businesses is consumed defending civil actions. We all know how much time depositions take. And so very soon, very quickly with this approach, the cost of not doing something about the problem of modern slavery in a company's supply chain outweighs the cost of doing something. So this is a bottom line demand side intervention, bringing civil actions against companies where you can prove at least one case of modern slavery. It will certainly demand corporate focus and incentivize better corporate behavior. Lastly, I would like to raise this. Civil litigation will reduce greenwashing. And that's because of a very simple concept, proof. Both criminal and civil actions demand that actual modern slavery due diligence be proved. They both require a corporate rebuttal of the claim of the case that was discovered in the supply chain. So in effect, they have to actually go through the steps of proving it didn't happen or that they did enough. To rule out recklessness, all reasonable measures must be taken and proved to have been taken. If all reasonable measures have been taken, but the case stands as proved in a civil action, the company's behavior was not intentional, but they could still be liable recklessly or negligently. <laughs> Negligence, just to clear it up, has a lower, a lesser level of liability than recklessness. Negligence just involves acting in a careless manner, while recklessness involves a person taking a risk, a company taking a risk while knowing their actions may cause harm to another. So you see the principle, the, the level of proof and the standard is quite low. The upshot of this, in the case of civil actions for cases of modern slavery in a supply chain, the corporate talk alone will no longer suffice. It's exactly the way demand side interve interventions should work. They become a source to incentivize positive change. Demanding proof, real proof, instead of press releases and glossy reports, that will bring substantive change to the way business operate in this let's say, rapacious capitalist paradigm we operate in. If both of these demand side approaches, public procurement and civil litigation, neither of which are difficult or complicated to start, are uh, arrows in our quiver, we are very quickly a lot better armed to eradicate modern slavery from business. And we would be a darn sight better off than we are now. So thank you, Michelle, for the time. To Brian, actually, uh, a very interesting uh, intervention. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, we appreciate uh, your, uh, um, yes, we definitely appreciate your expertise and your always uh, original, uh, 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 original uh, proposals and including, uh, including when you are speaking of uh, uh, demand-sided public procurement and uh, uh, what I, I like is that uh, indeed you've been uh, constantly uh, uh, stressing uh, the importance of demand side. Uh, come on. And uh, uh, and actually, uh, I think we 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 need actually to uh, to follow uh, your example. Uh, what uh, uh, I'm wondering also is that. Uh, your proposal for civil litigation, uh, how uh, the next speaker, how Professor Steiner will uh, uh, 
um, appreciate this. I think you, you are very convincing when you're speaking, but uh, also I need also the, uh, the appreciation of a, of a legal expert. And also it's, always have, it's always great to have a judge's opinion. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and, and then also what I thought, uh, uh, I, I liked that you were supporting Claire Potovesi uh, of the importance of risk and cost factors. Indeed, yeah. so, uh, uh, risk and cost factors are, are very important. Uh, I would be happy to give the floor again to Brian Islin and George Mark Steiner for additional reflections on this very important uh, uh, issue. Brian, I, I, I'm feeling so you are ready to shoot, no? <laughs> always, always ready to shoot, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to comment on was, uh, so with my, with my project at Slave Free Trade, one of the things we're trying to do is introduce what I call a third track in communications between businesses in supply chains. So what we've had up until now from, uh, from the 60s is supply chains are made up of disaggregated supply chain actors, companies buying and selling from each other. Now, there are two tracks to that dialogue. One track is price. The other track is quality. So this is a different quality that I'm talking about than to what uh, Mark was talking about in public procurement law. Uh, the quality in this case is about a certain number of kilos of co uh, coffee beans at a certain grade uh, and refined to a certain degree. So these quality characteristics are all about the product. So what we've seen since the 60s and arguably the 70s, actually, with this uh, the, 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 the manifestation, the spreading of global supply chains, is that these actors only talk to each other about these two characteristics. And as soon as the conversation changes to add anything else to the conversation, it shuts down. So if you ask any small business, for example, my, my cousin was setting up a drop shipping company uh, at one point, a fashion business. Uh, and so she needed to connect with suppliers who could provide quickly. Uh, and her experience with uh, companies in, in the supply chain for handbags and belts and and dresses and so on was exactly the same as everybody else's experience, which is that they get to their first level supplier, they ask about uh, uh, characteristics of quality and price and they understand that. And then as soon as they ask any questions about the ethicality or sustainability of these products, they get shut down. They hit a blank wall, the suppliers aren't providing it. So one of the really interesting things with, with what we're trying to do with Slave Free Trade is we, we connect each workplace in a supply chain by virtue of their human rights performance. So let's talk about a, a three-tier supply chain. A chocolatier goes to a cocoa, their supplier is a cocoa processor, their supplier is a plantation, so a, three, a classic three-tier supply chain. Uh, and in that supply chain, each of the workplaces in that chain gets a human, performance, a human rights performance score. And those scores are connected, those workplaces are connected, so that the chain score means the chocolate bar at the retail end can't go on the shelf unless each of the human rights uh, workplace, workplace is human rights compliant. Now, our hypothesis in putting all of this together was that we would be introducing this third track that suddenly that, that we felt that these companies would actually start then to talk about human rights if we connected them this way, because they become dependent on each other's human rights performance. In our pilot, the cocoa supply chain that I mentioned, it worked out exactly like that. These disaggregated supply chain actors started talking about price, that worked, continued talking about price and quality, and added human rights to their conversation. It became the third track, uh, and, and in some in some ways, it actually became, you know, compelling for them because the staff in the first workplace at the top of the supply chain suddenly actually they became interested, not just on a purchasing level, they became interested in the workplace conditions in the plantation at tier three, where they had no visibility whatsoever before. So it's really exciting to see these disaggregated supply chain actors turning into collaborative networked organizations because of the addition of human rights communication and understanding. So I wanted to say that. I, I would also ask for your comment on one of the other points, which was that you were talking in the Swiss laws about, you use the word sustainability quite a lot. Now, one of the interesting things that I've found with slave free trade is that whenever we talk sustainability with businesses or, or consumers, most of them don't include in sustainability ethicality. They don't include human rights. So when they talk sustainability, it's all green. 
which is why we have the term greenwashing, uh, whether it refers to human rights or the environment. So the definition of sustainability, one of, one of the things on my agenda is to broaden the definition. Sustainability has got to include the human. And if you think about it from an ESG perspective, uh, environment, social governance, the S is the poor cousin. It's the one never talked about at the table. Uh, it's like the cousin, nobody wants, the, the uncle, everyone, nobody wants to invite to the wedding. So so, social sustainability is the one that never gets talked about. So I, I would love to get your thoughts about how we can, what we might do to broaden the definition of, or the understanding of sustainability, not just in public perspective, but in, even within companies. Oh, yes. This is a really huge topic. I can give you an answer perhaps based on the European Union directive. So there were two reforms in Europe. 2004 was a reform more or less limited on green public procurement because social aspects were very disputed. And 2014, when the next reform came, it was crystal clear that sustainability means economics, environment, and social aspects in a European public procurement understanding. And since then, this is undisputed also inside the WTO and Switzerland because the European model made it really clear that this cannot be seen uh, uh, only green sustainability concept is absolutely it, it's deprived of its meaning. It, it makes no sense. And what is interesting that we can now see what happens in America. When you look after COVID-19, Corona, you see that Joe Biden announces a Build Back Better program. This is a kind of a comparable concept as a Green New Deal would be in Europe. And the problem is that the Americans, they are now where the Europeans have been 2004, seeing sustainability only as a green thing without implying ethical issues and social minimum standards. So we have to explain the US what happened in Europe in, in order to make them understand that they are going exactly the same way just 10 years later. Uh, no, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, actually, there are two things. First, I think uh, we, we need uh, to see that uh, integral ecology in the meaning of uh, 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 the Laudato C uh, encyclical is very much uh, uh, in in this direction, including the human in uh, the environment. Uh, second, I must say we we have now also uh, a question, and uh, uh, this question uh, is uh, uh, I don't know if you could possibly both uh, uh, try to answer it, but I would possibly ask first uh, Brian: Is there any company? that has a good track record so that it can be held up to others as a good example. When we began the fair trade movement, one of ways we go to put the products into mainstream supermarkets was to give examples of those who embrace fair trade. Now notice fewer fair trade products in the uh, supermarket. Can we build on a, a fair trade model? Uh, I don't know. Uh, could you possibly both try to uh, answer this question? Sure. Mm. Can I go first, Mark? Can I go first, Mark? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so build on fair trade model. Uh, you know, uh, I, I do want to answer the question directly, but I'll also uh, try and hedge and get around it a bit. But can we build on the fair trade model? You know, I think we have to recognize that fair trade has pretty much peaked. And one of the reasons for that, there are lots of reasons, but one of the reasons for that is that equal profit doesn't resonate emotionally with people anymore. It was a big thing in the 70s, big thing in the 80s. Uh, it's no longer there. People don't resonate with equal profit. So you get people going into a supermarket looking at two chocolates. One is a fair trade chocolate. They see there's a dollar seventy difference because of the premium on fair trade products. 61% uh, of which goes to the retailer, by the way. So 
it's interesting that people just don't feel strongly about fair trade anymore. And many people will not pay the dollar seventy and they'll put it back. Supermarkets know that, which is why they're now carrying less fair trade products. And in some in some supermarket cases, they've dropped fair trade products completely uh, because consumers just won't pay the premium anymore. So that's an interesting thing to consider. Another thing to consider is that fair trade is not a human rights standard. Fair trade has some characteristics around child labor, for example, as part of their framework, but they're not a human rights standard. They don't address a comprehensive range of human rights in workplaces. The other thing to consider is that they're a function of the old and let's say very strongly outmoded uh, for, uh, model of certification and audit. So that means that they put a label, certification and audit is where you put a label on something on the basis of uh, 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 an infrequent audit where people actually go out to a workplace and have a look in a very small percentage of supply chains and workplaces uh, and not even every year, every three years, for example. So certification and audit has been shown to be wanting in a failed model. The one dimensional label that goes on a product in the shelves in supermarkets for all the labels, not just fair trade, but uh, but uh, B Corp, Fairware, Better Cotton Initiative, they've all been shown to be really, really wanting when it comes to the proof of the pudding. So fair trade, we can learn from what fair trade did by mobilizing consumers with a label on products. They were one of the first social labels uh, since, uh, since abolition. Uh, and that's a very important thing that they did. They showed that you can move markets by moving consumers, which is a really important precedent. But uh, unfortunately, when it comes to, to human rights, I, I just don't find them very relevant for people anymore. I speak to people about it all the time, every day. Uh, and most people just think it's, it's plateaued. We can definitely learn from them. We can definitely canvas and, and corral demand at the consumer level. And that consumer demand, uh, uh, so I, I, let me just tell a quick story. Sorry, Mark, I'm taking the floor, but I just want to tell a quick story. So 20 years ago, one of my first cases was a forced labor case, which was also a child labor and human trafficking case, as it turned out. 12 year old boy shot in the head, dumped overboard from a prawn boat. Now, one of the very interesting things was that he was a 12 year old child. He was child labor. He was human trafficking and he was forced labor. And none of those definitions that we hold so dear to us at the national and international level meant a damn thing to him. None of them reflected what his needs were, none of them. So that was one of the first lessons I learned. But one of the other lessons was that the prawns that came from those boats ended up in supermarket freezers right across Europe. And I just put myself in that position 20 years ago, thinking at that time about a Parisian shopper standing in front of a supermarket freezer, Carrefour in Paris, for example, looking at the frozen prawns. They had absolutely no way of knowing what's going on behind those prawns. However, if we can put on the prawns that have been caught the right way with human rights standards applied and provable in real time, we can make that single shopper change their buying decision in 0.75 of a second. That buying preference multiplied millions of times sends a tsunami down the value chain. And that sends the message that, pre that preferential buying will be directed towards those companies that can prove human rights compliance in their workplaces. And then everybody down the value chain has to respond, including retailers. The consumers send a loud message to retailers when they take those actions. This is what we can learn. And this is what slave free trade is all about. Uh, Mark, you, you have something to add, certainly, yeah. Yes, the, pr the problem is that also when it comes to social minimum standards, we cannot avoid labels and certificates. For instance, what's very common in supply chain context is the label SA8000 to make sure that some social minimum standards are kept. So the idea of being able to do business in supply chain without labels and certificate would perhaps be a little bit naive. What is true is that we need to do more than this. And that's where uh, Brian and I, I think, easily agree. So this just to, to give you an additional information, because without labels and certificates, supply chain management will 
already because of a transaction costs logics in an economic understanding never work. Okay, uh, uh, Brian, uh, an additional comment? Or? Uh, no, I agree with Mark. Okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> but we know, and, and actually I would like to thank you for bringing Mark to this webinar because uh, thanks to you, we could, uh, you know, we are both Swiss and both based in Switzerland, but we needed you, uh, an Australian friend, to uh, bring us together. So, uh, well, wow. you know, I'm also made in Switzerland, right? I mean, yeah. my family is uh, 600 years in Glarus, Canton. <laughs> so. No, no, it did, it did. I just see a question there about is the UN human rights compliant? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Guaranteed, they are covered in slavery. Okay, I will, uh, I will just say that. Uh, and I hope uh, someone from the UN will respond. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, indeed you had very good special rapporteurs, you know, when uh, uh, now you have Professor uh, Obokata uh, yeah. uh, from Japan uh, and based uh, and teaching in, uh, in the UK. Uh, you have also other special rapporteurs like Professor Mulali. Uh, yeah. She's a professor in Ireland. Uh, we had Judge uh, uh, Maria Grazia John Marinaro from mm -hmm. Italy. I must say all those people, uh, and I can also name a few others, including a judge from South Africa. Uh, I must say all those were indeed uh, publishing quite interesting things. But I agree with you, Brian, that uh, um, next uh, to those interesting reports, I don't know what the end effect was, you know, and uh, they, they they would all readily admit that the UN is just covered in slavery. They buy and sell. Their procurement procedures are no different to any other public procurement institution in the system. But one of the things I wanted to say was that public procurement is uh, is we I think we get this sense. I think people get a sense that public procurement is this big institutional question right how do you move public procurement but in mm. fact one of the things is to look below the surface of that to the people behind in the organization i, I went i spoke at the national procurement institute conference in in the us uh, uh, two years ago now this is the national body for municipalities and counties across the united states so thousands of members when you sit down and talk to each of the category managers, purchasing managers, and so on at each of these institutions, one of the things that things that hits you immediately is that there's not a single one of them that wants to be buying slavery, not one. So those public procurement institutions are not a response to the values of the individuals behind the desks. If those individuals have a choice, it's just like the Parisian shopper with the prawns in front of them. It would take them minutes, less than minutes, to decide on a slavery-free procurement compared to the other tenders that are not. The human behind them is so important. What are their drivers? 